On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Apple joins the Iowa Data Center Club. Why isn't all the traffic on the web encrypted? And Google drops by with their counter abuse technology group. Twyet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyet, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 254, recorded August 25th, 2017. The Google Counter Abuse Team. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by the Amazon EC2 Container Service from AWS. Deploy Docker apps to the cloud without worrying about installing, updating, operating, or scaling container infrastructure. Learn how developers are deploying scalable apps at ecs.aws today. Welcome to Twyet. This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballester, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But it's an awfully big and complicated world. I'm going to need a little help from my friend, starting with Mr. Lou Maresca. He is... Uh, I'm just going to say bigwig because his title is ever evolving. He is a bigwig. He's a big deal at Microsoft. Lou, how are you, my friend? I'm doing wonderful. Doing great. Yeah, we're, we're getting ready for Ignite 20, September 25th. Check it out. Uh, that, that's going to be over in Florida, right? Orlando? Yep, yeah, Orlando Convention Center, and uh, it'll be a whole week of fun. I, I got to ask you, when they send you out to an event like that, uh, what is it like? Are you going to be working the booth or do you walk the floor? What's, what's your primary responsibility? That's funny. Yeah. Every time you get sent to an event like that, in order to make most, your return on your investment, they make you do pretty much everything. So you're going to be booth. We're going to be boothing. We'll be doing sessions. We're gonna do, I'm doing a pre-day. So on Sunday, come do a pre-day where you can basically do a training session. So we're doing everything. Uh, folks, we are breaking barriers here. That means that on Twyet, we will be the first show on the Twit TV network to have as a co-host a booth babe. <laughs> right. Also joining us is my good friend, and uh, I, I'm going to say my colleague from way back, Mr. Brian Chi. He is the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. He is the man who makes all the bits go on that side of the Pacific. Chibert, uh, we're getting stormy over here in the mainland. How is it looking in Hawaii? <laughs> We are getting a bit of rain and a lot of humidity, but no, no big deal. By the way, you've had a booth bunny. Both <laughs> myself and Carl Arbach have actually worn bunny ears in the Interop iLabs booths. Okay, this is true, but if you rewind the tape, you'll see that I said booth babe. And I'm sorry, yes, but I, neither I, you I, yeah. or Carl Arbach <laughs> qualify as booth babes. We have to move off this topic, folks. All right, gentlemen, we've got a great show for our audience. Not only are we going to be bringing in Google, but we're going to be bringing in an expert to talk about security, about the things that you're going to want to make sure you do to, well, secure your modern enterprise network. But before we do that, as we always do, let's go ahead and jump straight in to the blips. Uh, we know that Apple is dropping $1.3 billion on a new DC in Iowa. Now, first Microsoft, then Google and Facebook. And now Apple will be joining the Iowa Data Center Club. After cementing $208 million in local and state tax incentives, Apple CEO Tim Cook formally announced the company's intention to build a $1.3 billion, 400,000 square foot data center near Waukee, Iowa. Part of Apple's planned push to double their software and service revenue within three years, the new location will expand Apple's ability to provide Siri, iMessage, Apple Music, and App Store services in North America. Apple anticipates spending ten, $110 million to acquire and prep the land, $620 million on construction, $600 million on networking gear, and an additional $45 million in support equipment. The new facility is anticipated to create 550 temporary construction jobs and 50 permanent jobs when it comes online in 2020. <sighs> U.S. immigration is saying they're not using stingrays to find illegal immigrants. The acting head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, a.k.a. ICE, a federal agency charged with deportations, has confirmed in a new letter that it does not use cell site simulators, also known as stingrays, to locate undocumented immigrants. 
What they say further on in the article is that illegal immigrants can feel safe calling 911 since ICE is not using stingrays to find them. So while I have my doubts this is going to stay a policy once the permanent head of ICE takes office, it's nice to know at least one agency seems to be playing by the rules on the use of stingrays. Although it's a 28-page report, it's, it's a pretty good read. The Fortinet Q2 2017 Global Threat Landscape Report covers a large set of topics, including wanna cry and not pet ya. What really stuck out was the study around organizations that were actually breached. What was found was that 90% of organizations that were breached due to exploits were due to a three-year-old or even older vulnerability. I don't think we need a study to tell us what we already knew, but people and organizations alike are pretty slow to update things. This report essentially quantifies this for now, but let's add some t icing on top of that, which it says that 60% of organizations were actually exploited by a 10-year-old or even older vulnerability. I don't think I have to repeat myself here, but most hackers rely on open source exploits, which this report quantifies a bit as well. Fortinet also shows an interesting graphic that shows that the volume of exports during a week, and I bet you couldn't guess that the majority of the exploits are on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And this report's also a chock full of data, but there's also another report that came out this week from ACMI, which is also their quarterly statement around security. And it shows that there's also a number of DDoS attacks that have grown after the Mirai source code was released. So Mirai DDoS malware source code in September helped breathe essentially new life into the declining DDoS booter, booster net market that we've seen in the past. And botnets are now on the rise uh, so that DDoS for higher services have come up. And so all we're basically saying to everyone out there is patch your stuff. When we hear news about Unlimited and some sort of tech service company, it's usually about a cell carrier or service provider who is altering a previous agreement to make Unlimited into not Unlimited. But not this time. Amazon killed off their unlimited storage offering in June, but before they rolled up the unlimited storage closet, a carpet, one user really wanted to test how unlimited was unlimited. A user who goes by the Reddit username of BeastOn02 came up with the idea of pushing as much data into the AWS cloud as possible using a source of data with which he was apparently quite familiar. Porn. He taught himself SQL and Python, then wrote scripts to record, stream, and store adult cam sites to his Amazon storage account. In the process that took almost six months, the user managed to upload 1.8 petabytes of video content to Amazon. Now, how much porn is that? Well, if the content av averaged 480p, 1.8 petabytes amounts to almost 294 years of 24-7 viewing. Beast on O2 claims that this was just a test of Unlimited that happened to coincide with his love of adult entertainment. But some others are quick to point out that it's almost always users like Beast on that kill Unlimited plans. If you want to try his scripts, he's made them available on GitHub, though might I suggest not. Also, Amazon is a supporter of the TwitTV network. Well, happy birthday, V'ger. It's been 40 years since the last launch of Voyager, and boy, are we getting our money's worth. It has given us our first close-up images of planets like Jupiter's moon Io, the, red, the giant red spot, and Europa's ice flows. What they've really done is make us, for the first time, imagine looking beyond our planet and spawn just a few science fiction movies. So happy birthday, Voyager, our first truly deep space probe. It's called Ziva, and it's not going to take it anymore. The newest in the line of kernel exploits for Apple's infamous iOS, Ziva is one of the ones that showcase and raise some eyebrows. This not only gains arbitrary read-write access to your device, but it gains root access. Yep, it can do whatever it wants on your device at the OS level. In order to prove the vulnerabilities exist, a researcher from mobile security from Zimperium, Adam Donefeld, this past week published a proof of concept where it actually works on, on GitHub. Adam also posted the possibility of the vulnerability back in July where he exposed seven different exploits. Apple has patched most of them, but this one is still possible and on specific versions of iOS. How does the co code exploit the kernel? Well, it targets a less known system called Apple Av Driver, which is a kernel extension. This exploit used to drop a ref count of any iOS service object in the kernel and also send an arbitrary kernel pointer, which will be used by as a kernel uh, to a pointer to it, a valid iOS object. So if nothing else, 
it's nice that researchers are being open and vulnerable about these vulnerabilities they find, and they give companies like Apple a chance to patch them. Apple should be offering a, a pretty big bug bounty here if to, or a finder's fee, but for right now, Adam gets just a bit of fame. Again, patch your device. Yesterday, the U.S. District of Columbia Superior Court Chief Judge Robert Morin, overseeing the U.S. Department of Justice versus the DreamHost case, ruled neither fully in favor of the government nor the ISP. The case revolved around a ward from the DOJ for all user data connected to the Disrupt J20 site in connection to riots and attacks of vandalism during the Trump inauguration on January 20th. DreamHost balked because the warrant was overly broad, specifying neither individuals or groups of users, and then complained to the U.S. District Court that the DOJ was asking for bulk data on 1.3 million users, most of which had nothing to do with the riots. The district court agreed, and the DOJ agreed to amend their scope of the warrant to include activity only from July 1st, 2016 to January 20th, 2017, as well as excluding the IP addresses of visitors. Judge Morin further shortened that time scope from seven to four months, adding the caveat that prosecutors must explain why anything they move to seize is part of the investigation and will only allow the review of said data under his personal supervision. This could possibly be one of the best outcomes of a data seizure case involving the DOJ since digital property practices started butting up against real property rights. Though DreamHost still has reservations about the amount of data being turned over, the fact that a judge is requiring the warrant to be specific and the investigation to be supervised is a huge outcome for enterprise planning of future digital property seizures. Well, that does it for our blips. Next up, we're going to head to the bites, but first... Let's take a moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, do you want to make your services more agile? Of course you do. Do you want to make them easier to spin up? Well, who doesn't? Do you want to make them more predictable across unpredictability? Well, I think that's really the purpose of IT in general. Well, then you're in luck because This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by the Amazon EC2 container service, from Amazon Web Services. Now, we all know that developers love Docker containers because they give applications portability and consistency all the way from your laptop to production. But things can get complicated fast when the time comes to deploy, manage, scale, and secure containerized apps in the cloud. Now, it's one thing to know what your container should do once it hits production, but entirely another thing to have all the moving pieces fit together perfectly when it actually comes time to flip the switch. That's why Amazon created their EC2 container service to make it easy to run Docker apps in production. With EC2 container services, installing, updating, operating, and scaling your infrastructure happens automatically. As you move from development to production, EC2 CS will give you simple API calls that let you launch and stop Docker-enabled applications, query the state of your cluster, and natively integrate your app with powerful AWS services like security groups, elastic load balancing, EBS volumes, and more. Best of all, you only pay for the AWS compute and storage resources that you actually use. With Amazon EC2 Container Service, you can focus on building apps not spending time deploying, scaling, and managing your container infrastructure. Get back all the time for you to do what you do best. Learn more about Amazon EC2 Container Service at ecs.aws today. That's ecs.aws. And we thank Amazon Web Services for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's go ahead and jump into the bites. I've got a question for my co-host, and that is, why in the world are we still using the web in clear text? That's right, folks. We understand that way back when, when we first started playing around with things like HTML, it was understood that uh, there's not really a need for all that much security. So I could intercept a stream in transit and figure out exactly what's going on. But we have far since then moved on. And yet we still find that the bulk of traffic that's moving across the internet is not encrypted in any way, shape, or form. Now, Google is trying to do something about this right now. They are pressuring companies to provide security, more security for the people who visit their websites by encrypting all the traffic. Now, 
simple test. Uh, of course, I know that the Twilight Riot understands this, but for someone who might just be visiting, if you look at the URL in the address bar of your browser and it doesn't begin with HTTPS, then it is clear text, which means it can be read, it can be intercepted, and it has not even the most basic security measures enabled. Now, the question becomes... Why is this the case? There's been so much mo motion from Google, from Facebook, from Microsoft, from all the giants to move to encrypted communications, and yet we just haven't done it. Chibert, this is puzzling. I mean, it's not hard. This technology is not difficult to deploy and to manage. So why in the world do we still have clear text? Uh, because you're having trouble picking a domain name or a certificate name. I don't know. It certainly isn't cost anymore because the EFF a.k.a. letsenscript.org is giving away certs. Come on. Right. Yeah. And they're, they're even giving a wildcard cert. So if you're running a load balancer or a proxy server, still good. Come on. Yeah. Uh, right? Lou, uh, Lou uh, some people are saying that this just basically comes down to inertia. Uh, we've got a lot of the web that's not really well maintained anymore. It's just it's just out there. It just exists and it's, it's accessible. And so there is no, uh, well, there's no reason for someone to really update an archive that has been up for 10 years and might be up for another five. Is is there something that we could see from the giants, from, from the larger companies to, to really push us towards this idea of we are all safer when we all encrypt. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that holds merit to say that, you know, it is just inertia in some cases. But I do agree that if everything's encrypted, we have to less worry about that and worry more about other things, um, not transport related encryption, um, uh, other, you know, types of encryption and more data security and consistency and that kind of thing. But, you know, the same things kind of go back to, you know, the question you asked Chiber too is I, I truly really believe that um, as part of it being minutia, there's it could be also a cost thing uh, from the beginning, uh, but it's, it's also a cost thing from actually maintaining it as well, because obviously these certs, they expire after 90 days and it requires you to have some kind of infrastructure, smoke testing or something to verify that they're expired and renewing them. And so you have to have tooling around it. Um, so, again, it adds additional cost to your deployment. And if you're just doing a site like, let's say, Pinterest or something that you're just displaying information that doesn't necessarily need to be secured, they feel that, hey, why do we have to have this additional cost, especially around our tooling uh, and our deployment costs um, if we don't need it? Um, and so that all that as also I like to add too is it could be a compatibility thing because let's encrypt didn't always wasn't always compatible with everything um, they have a compatibility matrix even even today and you know things that they actually create you know certificates they create even though they're free they might not be compatible with your application um, and so it, it actually caused the problem there as well. All right, Chibert, I'm going to play devil's advocate here really quickly to, for someone who is maybe dragging their feet on uh, changing their setup to to encrypt everything. The first objection I might hear is, well, what I'm hosting just doesn't need to be encrypted. It's not sensitive. It's not particularly popular. It's It really is just an archive on the net so people can access the data. And they don't care about encrypting it. They don't care if people steal it. They don't care if people intercept it in transit. What would you say to someone who runs that kind of repository? What, what would be your cell to make them consider encrypting? You know... I, I equate this issue as, do you stop at a red light? Most of us do. You know, being a good netizen, let's, let's use that word, means that you go and try and protect people around you from potential problems. An encrypted website, one would hope, I'm not going to say will, but one would hope, would also make it a lot harder for someone to start slipping in, um, say, malware. And, you know, one of the, I'm, I'm going to be a devil's advocate to Lou, one of the reasons why Let's Encrypt has a compatibility matrix is that they want you to use their a piece of software that allows you to automatically update your certs. And the idea being is they want to eventually go to smaller and smaller intervals for cert changes. So right now, the default is actually 90 days, which is pretty cool. And if it automatically updates your certificate, then that starts getting around some problems with, you know, revocation lists and things like that. So 
maybe a good step in the right direction. I'm going to give DNS Dane another plug because I think that's a, another good um, step in the right direction. Um, but things need to mature more. And I'm actually really hoping to hear some of the uh, issues from our guests today because I think Google's doing a lot of really good things to try and get people to, one, get away from really bad passwords, you know, and also start really starting to secure things. You know, HTTPS is one of the stepping stones. There are more that need to happen. We need to, you know, do things like patching and so forth. But we really and truly need um, to have lots of different pieces all start working together and get beyond what is now what H HTML, H regular old HTTP is what, 20 plus years old now, yeah. or is it yeah. 25? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's time to move on, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, we've got Patrick Delahanty, who works here at Twitter. He's also in the chat room. And he brings up a very popular viewpoint, which is, uh, well, you know, I'll just update it the next time I update my site, which might be never. He runs several different sites, including a repository of all information about chips, the old 70s and 80s TV show. Uh, and he's not really concerned about encrypting it. Uh, and I think, I think, Chibert, you're right. We, we do need to provide a, a little bit more enticement, a few more reasons why someone would want to encrypt rather than it's just a good idea. But, uh, but Lou, let me give you the second devil's advocate question because the first one was all about I don't have anything that's worthy of encryption. There is another group, and I, I'd say that they're, actually quite vocal, who say this is a false sense of security. SSL doesn't actually really protect you. And so we don't, we shouldn't push this. We should push the next thing that will actually provide real security. Uh, do, do you buy into that? Is this, is this something we should just bypass and skip in favor of the next good thing? You know, and also just to be clear, when I comment about uh, before about people not doing because of cost and other things, I don't believe that either. But I don't also believe what they're saying is that this is not a step you should skip. I mean, like Cheever pointed out, it, it allows you to, uh, you know, even though you don't have necessarily secure data on your site, if people trust they're getting information from you, like, you know, some even just a consumption site, um, if they're trusting they're getting data from you, if, if, if you're if you don't have this in place, they can't guarantee they are getting data from you. It could be somewhere else. It could be you know, changed. It can be altered in some way, injected in some way. Uh, and you can't necessarily verify that. Um, and so I think that this is definitely a necessary step, even if it's not to secure the data that it has, it's, it's just a necessary step to ensure the data that you're getting is consistent with what the site was promoting. Um, and I, I think it's a necessary step across the board. And at some point they'll come up with another technology and there are some down in the pipe, uh, that will secure the data even more. And then you can kind of get both. Right. Right. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and move on to the next topic because I do want to save enough time for our guests. I'm thinking that that's actually going to be quite exciting. Uh, let's move from uh, secured websites to something new on the desktop. Now, for the longest time, we, we've known that Windows owns the enterprise desktop. It's all about it. It's everywhere. It's easy to manage. All the infrastructure is in place. And there have been a couple of attempts to dislodge them. Apple made a couple didn't work all that well. But when I was still living in D.C. and working for the national office, I remember receiving a box with a Google Chrome. Was it Chrome box? It was a Chrome box back then. The whole idea was that it allowed you to replace workstations, expensive workstations, with easily managed, easily installed, easily maintained devices that provided very basic, simple services that you might need from a desk worker, a browser, email, maybe some spreadsheets. Now, the box didn't work out all that well. It was it was a little bit limited for us. It didn't tie in very well to Active Directory. We didn't get the uh, the management features that we wanted out of it, which is why I was excited by a, a few stories that were released this past week about Google making a huge push into getting the Chrome book into the enterprise. Uh, uh, Chibert, follow me with this. Uh, the first couple of Chromebooks that I received, they were interesting. They were nice. And I thought, okay, this might be good as a, a student computer. This might be good as a, you know, a second or third device that you leave next to the TV. But I definitely didn't think that it had enough power or enough style mm -hmm. to really make a dent into the enterprise market. The newest generation of devices, something like the Acer R13, the Chromebook for work, have been fantastic. 
And they now in include, they integrate native features like Active Directory. They will use Microsoft uh, device management. Do you think that this, are we here now? Are, is this an actual option? Is this something that, that as an IT manager, I could say these four or five employees who are going to get $2,000 laptops or desktop are, are now going to get a $400 Chromebook? You know, I just bought an Acer R11 Chromebook. I, you know, the hinge was great. I, I like having touch. Um, the unfortunate thing is the websites that I use still need to catch up. There's a lot of um, touch areas. If I use a, if I use touch, I, it's not quite usable because the little touch spot's way too small. But <clears throat> the fact that I can now integrate in Active Directory, the fact that I can push out things like kiosk mode kiosk modes something that's been around for quite a while but the google enterprise management's gotten a lot better about how they do it so you can actually lock users into specific applications um so kiosk i'm using sign builder and the ability to be able to go and push a lot of things out um, set standards a lot of things that the enterprise has been wanting is there it's been a I'm not I'm not even gonna say a long time coming it it's been dribbling in um, but when you start looking at this this chart there's a heck of a lot of things in there that really makes a lot of sense right and the apps have caught up you know there's there's actually some pretty there's actually a Microsoft version of remote desktop for Chrome OS um, VNC for Chrome OS there's a really good SSH all a lot of things that I need heck I uh, friend's laptop just died. You know, the hard drive's dying. So I loaned her my Chromebook, and I was really surprised. I could take her HP Office Jet that's USB only, plug it into the Chromebook, and we were able to print very easily. Um, so a lot of my original perceptions of the Chrome OS have gone away, and certainly in the K through 12 environment, it's pretty decent. You know, there's an awful lot of schools that are just going all in. And the University of Hawaii is a Google university, and gee, it's been working really nicely for us. Right, right. And, and you know, you, you were talking about the subscription service, about $50 per, is it $50 per year per device that you want to use this full feature set? And when you look at the full feature set, it's incredibly enticing. I mean, we're, of course, it's got Active Directory. It's got MDM. You've got single sign-on. You've got all the things that, have been the, the the little nitpicks that have kept me from moving devices away from Microsoft uh, and from Windows. Uh, and I think even Microsoft recognizes that this kind of strategy might work. That's the whole idea behind S. I mean, that's Windows S. Lou, Microsoft is, uh, they're in this weird spot right now, this transition point where as they move away from the Microsoft that they were during the bomber years, to the Microsoft they are under the Nadella years, and they get really into that services architecture group, they don't really care what operating system you're using to run Microsoft apps as long as you're running Microsoft apps. So this does that explain why I'm seeing more native Microsoft support inside of, of competing products? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think um, you know Chromebooks obviously definitely hold merit, and they do make sense for the enterprise because again, uh, they allow you to use kind of these remote kind of capability. Um, but I, I think they exactly right. It holds merit because you know Microsoft is, in a personal opinion, is, is they're targeting Windows 10 S, and I think that um, you know we we actually are embracing the Satya world more so than we were embracing the old monolithic you know world of native applications. I think you know we. Our, especially on the office team, we think of it like a, a godsend to be able to deploy new updates to the office suites much easier and innovate and start to move forward and bring value to customers uh, more so than not. In fact, that's where the power of Windows S plus Office comes in is, you know, if you've already bought into that ecosystem and you still want kind of the power of, of a type of a Chromebook type style of device, you get that. So cheap, cheaper devices, but still locked down. But then you still get the full power of Office. So, and then that's Office is, is, is service delivered. So I think, again, we can continuous update and continuous deliver that application as a service. So I think, um, and you still get the raw native power of that application. So I think that's somewhere where 
there's some advantages to both, I think. And again, depending on the enterprise's need, it could either way, it could, you could kind of go either way. Yeah. And, and the math is really in favor of that because when you break it down, yes, it was nice to have that big monolithic block of windows, but do you want to make a $50 licensing fee on 500 million installations of windows or do you want to make $1,000 per dynamic seat on a billion devices? Uh, and, I, you know, that's I think that's what's really enabling it. They're realizing, OK, yeah, you know what? Uh, we should make all these other platforms work really well with the things that make us a lot of money. Go, fig go figure that that would be in an enterprise discussion. Uh, Chibert, anything left on this? I mean... Uh, I, I'm I'm actually going to start working with a a Chromebook full time. It's going to be my secondary laptop. I just want to see how much I'm going to miss having a full featured Windows desktop. Is is there something else that that needs to come into the picture in order to make this truly an acceptable solution to enterprise, or are are we there and now it's just time for acceptance? Actually, I think the missing piece is VDI. Because there's still going to be people that need a full thick desktop, but do they need it with th to carry it with them? And so we've had Ericom on, and we've had a Wingu on, and we've certainly had a lot of people, you know, talking about VDI. I think maybe just maybe this might be what brings VDI back, and especially when we start talking about uh, virtual apps rather than full desktops. I think platform as a service is a dead end i think application as a service or something like that is combined with something like a chrome chrome os based device certainly makes an awful lot of sense to me and allows you to gently ease into a transition and here's one of the things that actually helped make up my mind about buying a chromebook being able to power wash it before i walk through customs and say Knock yourself out, TSA. <laughs> oh, Chibert, I can always count on you for a, a, a semi-polite rant behind a smile. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, now comes the time of the show that I really enjoy, and that's when we get to bring in a guest who can drop some knowledge on the Twyat Ride. And in this case, I'm welcoming to the show Mr. Mark Risher. He is the Director of Product Management on Counter Abuse Technology at Google. Uh, he was the Director of uh, uh, the CEO and Co-Founder of, of, of Imperium before it was acquired by Google in 2014. Imperium was a SaaS anti-abuse and security provider, and he was also the spam czar at Yahoo. So he's got a lot of experience in this area. Mark, thank you very much for joining us on Twyat. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. What is counter abuse technology. I'm sure that our audience can be running those terms through their head and coming up with all kinds of responsibilities that might fit under that banner. But in your words, what do you do on a, on a daily basis? Sure. I work at Google to basically protect our users, our accounts, and our products from uh, unwanted activity, from malicious activity, from uh, you know, from spam, certainly, but also from targeted account hijacking and all the different uh, bad things that people might do with uh, with Google accounts and Google products. Now, the, the funny thing about that description is at once, it sounds like, oh, yeah, that's really simple. That's the simplest thing I've ever heard. And also, that encompasses so much. That is, the responsibilities are incredible. It's, it's, it's not just, well, we keep our users safe. It's we keep our users safe from attacks, external and internal, and we keep them from doing stupid things to themselves. <laughs> so uh, how, many, how big of a department do you need to be able to cover all those threats? Yeah, I mean, we have a, a lot of people, but we also work pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that helps, that helps. Okay, so let's, let's start at the beginning. As I'm building up a policy to protect my users uh, mm -hmm. from spam, from malicious attacks, from malware, from advanced persistent threats, what, what are the building blocks? When I start my foundation of security, what are the things that you think I need to look at in order to build up something that, that actually has a possibility of, of protecting my users? I would say probably the, the main takeaway, the, the one thing to keep in mind is that there are no silver bullets, there is no single shield. So the way that I'd recommend for you is similar to how we've approached it, which is many, many layers. 
you know, one model that we use in a lot of our security offerings is uh, essentially three pillars. It is looking at prevention, you know, when can we keep the user out, keep the bad attacker out. Detection, should they get past that first step, how quickly and loudly can we sound the alarm? And then mitigation, what steps can we take either in advance or immediately afterwards to clean up and sort of limit the blast radius, you know, control how much badness could take place. And where do you see the biggest problem in the enterprise there? I mean, as, as you just explained those steps, is there one area that you think we're very deficient in? Hmm. I think frequently it, the deficiency in enterprise is neglecting to think about that breadth of, of problem space. You know, there's many times, particularly in security, where just because of human nature, we want to find this one perfect solution. We're like, you know, once I deploy 2FA, I'm going to be good. Or once I, you know, put this new firewall in place, I'm going to be good. But that doesn't work. And that's just the sort of security asymmetry, the attacker defender balance of power that uh, requires you to always be thinking. One important part, because I work in this sort of gray area of abuse, is there are no absolutes. And, and our whole team recognizes and operates that way that you need to be continuously evaluating, you need to be continuously modeling what the attackers might do next, and you need to be continuously innovating and staying on top of those new developments, uh, as well as keeping track of what your legitimate users want, because that's an important concern too. I, I want to talk about that asymmetrical nature of security, because that's the whole cat and mouse game between attacker defender. But, right. but before we go there, you, you mentioned uh, the gray area. What mm. what would you consider the black area, the white area, and the gray area of of uh, gray area of security? Sure. So uh, the team that I work on, we think of ourselves as abuse in this gray area. And the metaphor that I use with a non technical audience, so maybe not exactly right for this show, is there's two ways to break into a bank. One of them involves dynamite, and the other involves a fake ID and a you know Groucho glasses. And so to me. Dynamite is in that black and white area. If you okay. see somebody unloading a truck full of high explosives near a bank, like you could pretty clearly act upon that. If, on the other hand, you see someone walking towards a bank with a mustache and thick glasses, you know, it's a much more subjective decision. There isn't a simple hard and fast rule. And instead, it requires a lot of analysis. It requires a lot of signals. It requires a lot of weaker and maybe more noisy signals. You know, what is the what are the circumstances under which this happens? You know, why is the person coming? What are they trying to do? And to get out of the analogy into the real world, that would be if somebody tries to log into your account on, let's say, a Google, uh, you know, a Google account, there's a black and white, which is if you're coming in on port 23, like that's not supposed to be happening. Right. Uh, but then there's this gray, which is somebody's logging in through the website, but they're logging in from, let's say, an unusual place or an unusual uh, computer or under strange circumstances, or once they log in, what they start doing doesn't match your normal patterns. That's that gray area where we're dealing with you know, a lot of uh, very complicated and challenging data modeling to try to separate good from bad, legitimate from illegitimate. I'm glad that you brought up that that whole gray area and the data modeling because that's that's been the difficulty, which is as technology gets more advanced, we've been able to protect ourselves more and more. You mentioned it, uh, stronger passwords than multi-factor authentication and every little bit of technology that we tack on. But as we've done that, the attackers have become far more sophisticated. They've become right. more subtle in their approaches. They've been able to, to uh, fish without it looking like they're fishing. Um, yes. And as a result that you have it very asymmetrical. It's so difficult for me to anticipate all the different areas that I need to protect versus what an attacker needs to see, which is I just need one point of entry. I just need right. one user who's not following policy. I just need one person who opens up an attachment. I just need one service that isn't defended and I'm in. So how, how has Google responded to that? Because asymmetrical warfare is a losing proposition. <laughs> yes. So there, there certainly are challenges with those types of, um, you know, the dimensions that you're talking about. The fact that we need to secure, secure every door, every window, every opening, and the attackers just need to find one. The way that we deal with it, it is these, these three pillars I laid out before. So it is 
paying attention to you know, different stages at which you can analyze and detect. But the other part is leveraging this very broad data source so that we can, in a way that's that's certainly you know privacy preserving and that understands what our users expect, but that also takes advantage of the fact that we see a large fraction of uh, both good and bad activity. And therefore, we can use technologies like our continued investment in machine learning to spot the differences, to spot the anomalies. So that's really our big advantage is when you have uh, when you have a weak signal, when you have a lot of attacks, what you want to do is pool as much information as you can together and then use very smart, very sophisticated algorithms to be able to weed through it and, and draw that decision boundary. All right. Let, let's take one, one step back again. Uh, of course, security is going to start with the password. And for years, we've been preaching to our users about how they should create their passwords and what they should do with their passwords once they're created and how often they should change them. And I get the feeling that my users are just as unsophisticated in making passwords now as they were 20 years ago. Is the password really the start of security or, or do advanced security experts like yourself consider them pretty much a dead thing? Well, it's certainly not dead because there are trillions and trillions of passwords that are out there and they're still very much in use. Um, but they unfortunately don't really meet the needs of the internet right now. And so we have this challenge. We're stuck with something that for you know, legacy and historical reasons uh, we're, we're stuck with. And yet it is too hard for good users and too easy for bad users to attack. You know, there's been a lot of, um, maybe not mea culpa, but sort of, moving on strategically on, on passwords, particularly in, in recent months, where people are realizing that since one of the primary vectors by which accounts are compromised is phishing, it doesn't matter how many capital letters and symbols and strange punctuation marks you have there if you're typing it into the into a fake web page. Um, and so that's why at Google, again, with this multi-part model, we've been looking at a lot of things above and beyond the password. In fact, right now we're in a place where even if someone knows your password and your username and knows your phone number, uh, still the vast majority of the time, well over 99% of the time, they're not able to get through because we serve up dynamic challenges, we ask for additional information, we leverage other signals and other resources to ensure that it truly is the legitimate user. Wait, wait a minute. Why, why do I have to do all that? Why can't I just use multi-factor authentication? I mean, it's definitely not as weak as a password. It it does incorporate a couple of best practices and security. Something I know, something I have. Uh, yep. Isn't that my magic bullet? Don't don't I just uh, in, in, activate two-factor or three-factor authentication on my yep. Google service stack, and I'm good. <laughs> I wish. So as I said before, there aren't silver bullets. I think that's why you use that phrase. Um, so certainly two-factor authentication is a step in the right direction. And it's worth noting that there are many different flavors of two-factor authentication. Your audience may know, but just briefly, you, you mentioned something I have, something I know, something I am, or traditionally the three factors. But there's different strengths of ways to determine that. Just like with something I know, i.e. a password, it could be a three-digit pin, it could be a you know incredibly complex long string. Similarly, there are dimensions on the something I have. It could be a text message that comes to what we think is your phone, or it could be uh, something much stronger like the security T technology, which um, you know we have helped to standardize and are now rolling out very broadly. Right, right. So if it's not going to be multi-factor authentication, what what is that next step? You've, you've hinted at it a little bit. What's What's the new strategy that the, the listeners of this show should start to research? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't try to say it's not multi-factor authentication. What I was more saying is that multi-factor authentication is part of a larger suite. It's one of the layers that we work on. So going back to the model from a few minutes ago, multi-factor is a great preventative measure. It is a good way of saying that, uh, you know, I can block a lot of naive attacks. I can block a lot of innocent attacks by requiring additional factors at that, that front door, that initial gateway point. Um, but... Availability is also important. You know, at Google, we have uh, billions of users that we want to to make sure they can get in. You know, there's one way to solve security, which is we could shut down all our services and we could say you can only log in if you submit a DNA sample by registered mail. But obviously, our users expect more. And I think for your audience and people administering other authentication systems, the same is the case. And so, when you're going to have to make that trade-off, you're going to have some 
attackers that get through or a lot of legitimate users that don't get through that first step. And now that's where it becomes part of a suite. So if I have multi-factor authentication, all is well and good until I drop my authenticator in the river or my phone gets stolen out of my backpack. And then the question is, what next? That's where I'd want you know, your audience to also think about how are we going to detect if someone comes in there? How are we going to shore up whatever channels that we use for recovery? How are we going to uh, limit the ability for somebody to do damage should they get through? Got it. Got it. Let's, let's take a step up into the ivory tower just a little bit because Along with this discussion of the evolving nature of authentication, I think we need to talk about how much has changed in just the last 15 years with really the, uh, the wholesale transition of the traditional premise networking model into cloud. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. In fact, it was really at the start of this show on the Twit TV network where we started talking about uh, hybrid deployment or cloud deployment as it was experimental. Some companies are trying it. They're not really sure if they want to stick with it. And now that's the norm. Everything is in the cloud. You start in the cloud. Maybe you go on-prem if there's a there's a, a very unique challenge that you have to solve with on-prem equipment. But other than that, you do everything in the cloud. That has to change the security dynamic tremendously because if I can no longer count on my physical security to, to give me a level of control over my services and my data, I need to be incredibly uh, secure with the type of, uh, of measures I put into my cloud-based services. How do you deal with that? And how have you seen the threat evolve over that time? Yes, we've seen the threat evolve exactly as you say. Um, you know, internally, people are probably familiar with Google's paper on Beyond Corp, which is the sort of deperimeterization, saying you can't, uh, for both BYOD and sort of agility reasons as well as security reasons, you can't rely on your users only only coming through a specific machine connected, a specific endpoint connected to a specific network node and, and all of that. And so we have pushed a lot of the uh, security to different points of the system so that you have high availability and still can offer the same or in fact better security guarantees. So that's one piece of it. The other is looking at all these different layers and towards the mitigation, that's where you know, cloud providers to some degree have an advantage because when your IT staff is asleep or taking a bathroom break, chances are that the you know larger cloud providers are able to have somebody that's monitoring for patches, have somebody that's looking at new attacks, have somebody that's running these you know ML al algorithms and these kind of broad sieves to look for data anomalies for suspicious activity. That's one of the strengths that you have by kind of banding together so that if you're not the one that's attacked first, you benefit from other people's uh, visibility and information. Right, right. Uh, what, what are the threats specifically that you're seeing? What, what have been the, uh, the ones that have been most challenging to protect your users against over, say, the last five months? Yeah, I think one of the biggest changes that is is a challenge and also the focus area is the shift from sort of broad-based opportunistic attacks towards much more targeted, much more refined ones. I think you alluded to this in the opening that really gone are the days of a phishing message that just says, I'm a prince from Nigeria, please send me your information. <laughs> like no one falls for that. Or if they do, we're able to catch them with very, very high accuracy. So what's shifted is much, much more targeted, much more refined messages. This is where a message comes that uh, they've taken some time to research who the target is. They've personalized it. They've maybe uh, put in a unique URL that's only being sent to one target. This sort of shift is the biggest thing that we see. This is the biggest evolution from the attack side. Uh, and that's something where from a defense side, we've had to really look at what are the types of signals, what are the type of mechanisms that we want to utilize to catch them. Right. I, I was just thinking the other day, I, I, uh, I got a phishing email and I get them all the time. But this one, it was interesting because it, it just said, I thought you might like these and it had an attachment of mychildren.jpg. And yep. I, I thought, oh, that is the, that is the worst targeted uh, phishing email ever. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, Actually or it could not. have been the best targeted <laughs> phishing email ever. Yeah. And, and, and of course, that's, that's not sophisticated by, by any way, shape, or form. But I think you're right. We've, we've seen over the, the last couple of years that attacks have become much more subtle. I, I bring up the Sony attack. There was a massive DDoS attack that was launched. 
and everyone was paying attention to the DDoS attack, but that's not where the attack was coming from. The, that right. was a cover for the exfiltration of data from the network. Um, yep. And that's far, that was far more sophisticated than we expected uh, any sort of, of cyber attack to be. Um, how do you defend against that? I mean, do you have someone there who's always thinking, I think this might be a, a, a diversion. I think there might be something else that we need to take a look at. How, how does it work within Google as you're looking at which attacks to respond to? Yes. So that is how I was referring before to kind of this, this breadth in the detection camp of having many, many different specialists that are all sort of bringing together. Specialists being either people or systems or frequently a combination of the two. So, you know, identifying is this DDoS really the problem or is it a smokescreen? That's really not the way I would look at it. Instead, I would say the DDoS is a problem. Like, yes, let's deal with that, but let's not take our eye off of other things that might be left unprotected. This is somewhat related to how sometimes defenses can be used uh, against us. Like one of the challenges <laughs> with um, one of the, with the challenges with people locking down accounts is that the easier we make it to lock down your account, the more likely that a attacker might utilize that to sort of keep the legitimate owner out. So basically, I break into your house and then I change the locks and now I live there. And so likewise, what you want to do is make sure that different teams remain focused on their specialties, different systems are constantly monitoring, and that you bring all that data together so that you can see these more subtle patterns that might be dwarfed by uh, the kind of broader, more obvious first attack. Mark, I have to say you have one of the coolest jobs ever, but uh, but I, I want to go ahead and bring in my co-hosts. Let's get them back into the conversation because they've been chomping at the bit. Uh, they've been asking questions in a, in a personal chat. Chibert, I want to start with you because you've had some experience with the use of enterprise keys. Um, do, you, do you think that's a strategy for Google as they expand to enterprise support? Well, you know, keys have changed over the years. This is my old notice, no display, batteries long dead. Uh, this is an $8 key. This one happens to be the U, U2F0, $8 um, security key. Obviously, I've been playing with YubiKeys, but there's also another one like uh, what Steve Gibson's doing, their uh, SQRL project. So the question really becomes... This is all examples of multi-factor authentication, but we've seen so many different versions coming out that what's happening on adoption? What are you guys seeing? Has the Google Authenticator and the Google Authentication Toolkits actually gotten some um, traction? And if so, you know, is this a direction you think we should be going? You know, what, what are the pros and cons that you can see? Yes, absolutely. It's a direction we should be going. So worth explaining of the two keys you showed up there, the RSA and then the U2F, uh, there is a huge fundamental difference between them. And we've been working to make that more clear to the marketplace because sometimes people think, you know, I use two factor, therefore I'm good and, and miss the, the variation. For example, the key difference is that the RSA key that you showed, it displays or when it's battery worked, it displayed number, a code, a time-based one-time password that you type into a website. And unfortunately, you could also type into a fake website, a man-in-the-middle attack. On the other hand, that U2F standard, the other one you had, is what we call origin bound, meaning it will only work when you are visiting the legitimate official website that you want it to be on. And that's a huge distinction because uh, it's essentially it's something that, that can't be fished or definitely not with the same uh, techniques and tools that have been used before. It's a much more high-grade attack. So we feel that U2F and standards like that are tremendously valuable. And in fact, Google... Uh, helped invent the security key, the U2F standard, and then charter this group that is now called FIDO, Fast Identity Online, which has created a standard so that all parties can play together. And in fact, there's a great benefit that once you buy one of these things, you can use the same one on many different sites, and there's a number of privacy-preserving properties so that the sites don't have to know, but it's easy for you to manage. I, I want to go to Lou next, because I saw Lou bobbing his head in my monitor when you talked about using multi-factor authentication, but using it more intelligently, looking mm. at other things other than just the basics of uh, something you know, something you are, and something you have. Uh, right. Lou, is multi-factor authentication still something that you believe in? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one thing I was saying in the chat was I, I see, uh, and this would be even a question back, is I see m more complex scenarios that are integrated with, with these multi-factor scenarios. Like, for instance, you know, having authenticators, but then adding authenticators, adding biometrics on top of the authenticators, and then, you know, and then, you know, different scenarios where it kind of adds a layer of security. And, you know, again, it gives you the ability to kind of do it for multiple devices and locations that you know and that you have access to. Um, and again, it still keeps the security level of security, even though you might not have access to some specific things. Um, so I'm curious to see if the, that's the pattern people are going to is just lowering that barrier of entry, but still having that layer of security uh, where you can, again, authenticate yourself, maybe even using biometrics, but making it easier and uh, for users to do that. Absolutely. I think that easiness thing is truly important. As I said before, you know, Large providers have billions of accounts, but even an enterprise that has uh, 10,000 seats, it can be difficult to all at once roll out security keys or hard factors to everyone. And it's important to think through how the different pieces fit together and, and layer together. So at Google, we are doing as much as possible implicitly. I mentioned before that uh, behind the scenes, our systems are blocking tremendous volumes of, of attacks um, with sort of implicit two-factor authentication. We're able to, to operate off of signals that we have. You know, is this a familiar location, a familiar machine, a familiar behavior pattern, like I mentioned. But then on top of that, absolutely multi-factor is the direction to go. And I have, I mean, even just here in front of me, like, you know, various different form factors that we're playing with. We have one that's a, this is a BLE, NFC, and USB. So it works across a wide variety of uh, different hardware. This is absolutely a part of our strategy. It's just a question of, for a diverse population, how quickly can we get it rolled out to all of them and uh, how many of them will work with it? You know, one thing that we noticed that matters certainly in the consumer world and to some degree in the enterprise is that users won't take more security than they, uh, than they feel they need. You know, you could put 11 deadbolts on someone's front door, but you'll find that after time they stop locking them because it's just annoying. And likewise, if you say in order to authenticate, you have to go through this very convoluted rigmarole, uh, you'll find gaps. In fact, that's where passwords fail. You know, when we said as a policy, not we, but the industry, you need to have 16 letters, capital, lowercase digits, punctuation, but not that other punctuation. What we find is that people write the word password and then put a dollar sign at the end or an exclamation point at the end. So they'll find ways to work around the best intended policies if they feel that it's getting in their way of productivity. I'm glad you brought that up because that's... That's actually something that every IT person watching us right now understands. We yeah. would love to roll out all the latest and greatest security technologies. We would love to force users to, to use best practices when choosing passwords and when securing their, their data and their accounts. But ultimately, it will come down to they don't have to do any of it. And if I make it so convoluted, then no one will use my network. And suddenly, right. my network is not useful as the thing that I needed right. it to do. But... We're talking about the mythical 10,000 seat enterprise environment. You can literally, with a security policy change, affect tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of users. So how, how do you walk that line? I, I, I'm asking for, for real usable knowledge for the Twyatt Riot. What's, what is a golden rule, a maxim that they can hold on to when they try to push users into the next level of security? One that we look at is essentially understanding those users. You know, when you get up to numbers that large, there's no such thing as an average user anymore. You know, talking about Google services, you could have one of your audience that's probably very tech savvy, that has many, many different devices, that, you know, maybe is more likely to be a business traveler. And then at the other extreme, there could be somebody with his or her first uh, Android phone that's really never interacted with the internet before and has a very different behavior model. So one of them is thinking about that and avoiding this holistic, we need to roll it out to everyone or it's not useful. A second part is understanding the, the pieces that we can do and where they have to fit into the chain. So U2F multi-factor is fantastically secure as a preventative measure, but also because there's a physical piece of equipment, it's going to be slower and, and harder to get to every last user. So that's where looking at what you can do server side, what you can do through policy, what you can do through things like, uh, you know, identity aware proxies and other capabilities that we and other cloud providers offer that helps you 
add some of these benefits before you have to wait for everything. Again, the sort of perfect is the enemy of the good challenge. And then the last one is, I mentioned mitigation, you know, what can we do to limit the ability for an attacker to do damage? So that might mean, uh, you know, not saying that essentially there's, there's one gate, the initial login point, and anyone who makes it past has carte blanche access to my system, but instead to say that we have layers, that we have uh, risk checks at, at many different points, that we look at, is the action you're doing right now the sort of thing you do after the thing you just did. And if not, maybe we'll give you an additional challenge. Maybe we'll take some additional steps at that point. We've been speaking with Mark Risher. He is a uh, product manager at Google. He's, he's the person who keeps you safe. He makes sure that your account, your data, your digital life isn't abused. Mark, I want to thank you so very much for being on This Week in Enterprise Tech. We're, we're going to have you back. We're definitely going to invite you back because we want to we want to put you with a, a panel of some other people and maybe really get into it as to what the next generation of security policy looks like. Uh, but until then, could you please tell our audience where they can find you, where they can find the work that your department does, and perhaps maybe read up a little bit on their own about the security that they should be using? Sure. I think one of them, and probably the, the main thing to remember, if nothing else, is the URL security.google.com. So when in doubt, if you receive an email that looks like it might be real or might not, if you are you know, prompted to check anything about your account status, that's the main URL to remember. And from there, you can get to all of the official authoritative information about your Google accounts. So security.google.com is the main starting place. In addition, though, there are many other pieces that we're doing. We're, we're doing outreach through, uh, through programs such as this one and talking to the Twyatt Riot. Um, we, are, uh, we have plenty of documentation out there. We are working on our Google Online Security blog where we talk about best practices. We talk about new techniques and the technology that we've done. Uh, we present at a lot of industry and academic conferences. You know, we're the founding sponsor of Usenix's Enigma conference, which is coming up in January, uh, and many others. And we're trying to be in your face, so we'd love to come back and be part of your panel. Fantastic. Again, Mark Risher, he is the Director of Product Management on Counter Abuse Technology at Google. Mark, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Folks, you've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 enterprise security keys. I want to thank everyone who makes the show possible. Of course, to Chebert and Lou. Chebert, what are you up to, my friend? Other, other than fighting off the, uh, the tropical rains, uh, do, do you have any geek events happening that the Twilight Riot should know about? No. This morning, I was actually hosting a dive. The... Uh, RV Nautilus was diving on the USS Bugara in the Olympic National Marine Sanctuary off Washington State. It's a sister ship to the USS Bofin. And uh, so we we're the Nautilus was diving on that and we we're streaming it live. It was a lot of fun. Actually, what I think I'm going to do is I, I've got a big giant box of these. I think I'm going to put hooks on them <laughs> and use them as Christmas ornaments. What do you think? <laughs> That will be the most secure tree in the history of Christmas. I think it will lead to a story how Chebert saved Christmas. Can we can we do this? Actually, can yeah, I, maybe. Can, can that be our Christmas episode? Yeah, actually, I think what we need to do is uh, I think your suggestion of having um, um, Mar um, having the Google guy, sorry, I Mark, Mark. Oh, with talk with uh, Steve Gibson. Yeah, uh, actually, quite right. What do you think? Come on, uh, Mark. Uh, we've got a, a man here at our network by the name of Steve Gibson who uh, wants to introduce you to a squirrel. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll we'll just tease it at that. <laughs> also, we need to give uh, give big props out to Lou Maresca. Lou, you're going to be heading over to Orlando when? Yeah, I'm heading over on the 23rd, so I'll be there for the day before the pre-day, the Sunday pre-day. Uh, we're doing a graph plus Azure function pre-day, so check that out. Come on, come on out if you want to do some lab work and have some developers uh, work with you on it. And of course, we're also doing a bunch of Azure sessions during Ignite around graph and and SDK integration with your current workflow and using the graph and so on. So it should be fun. Yeah, so if any of you are going to be at Ignite, you need to stop by the Microsoft booth often. Find Lou, 
take a picture with him and put it on Twitter because, uh, you know, I, I've, I, I actually haven't seen Lou in person for, what, two years. And it, it would be nice to prove that he actually still exists outside <laughs> of virtual reality. It's my Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> also, thanks to you, to the person who drops in every week. We wouldn't have a show without you, and we want to make it easier for you to get your quiet fix every week. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash quiet. There you'll find all of our back episodes, our show notes, so the links to the stories that we've talked about, as well as, and this is so important, a place to subscribe. Folks, if you want to know how to support the show, how to support the host, and how to make sure that we can keep bringing you all the best enterprise topics, this is it. Subscribe to the audio version, the video version, or the high-definition video version. Pass it off to your friends. Help spread the gospel of good tech here, again, at twit.tv slash quiet. Also, thanks to everyone here at the studio who makes this show possible. To Lisa and Leo, who let us continue to do Twiet each and every single week. To uh, Alex, who engineers all the buttons and cables that keep us running. And to my super TD, Kevin. Now, Kevin, I don't know if you have a camera on yourself, but towards the end of every episode is the time when we typically ask you a question of knowledge from the episode. And uh, we try to give you a chance at redemption. So let me ask you this. According to Google's security policy, two-factor authentication should involve what two factors? Uh, phone and Padre. Oh, I'm sorry. The answer was peanut butter and chocolate. But thank you. We'll try I'm to get allergic. you at the, sorry, the next episode of Twiet. Until then, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit. Just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Just keep quiet.